We have with us today uh, Susan McKay, who's a co-founder and CEO of Sarah Helix. Susan earned a PhD in chemistry from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and a BS in chemistry at the College of William and Mary in Virginia. She has started and run two different companies in Maine. Prior to this, she worked in corporate research and development at 3M in Minnesota and did product development work at Physical Electronics. Um, and that's all I can do for a, a bio for Susan because all of you industry folks are very, you don't talk a lot about yourself. So I, <laughs> I'm gonna let her just dive right in and let us know about her work. Thank you. So thank you again for my So I'm here to talk to you today about my company, Siri Helix, and the technology we've been developing and what's unique about it in terms of the science that underlies it. So our motivation at Siri Helix is to address a growing concern of the inaccessibility of fresh water and how can products like ours <coughs> enable um, more efficient use of fresh water resources. So as you've heard already today, the world is mostly made up of water. However, what most people don't know is that only 3% of the water on Earth is fresh water, and out of that, less than 1% is accessible to humans. And so in Maine, we have abundant water. However, you don't have to go far in the US and across the continent to find regions that are under extreme water stress. And in fact, by 2020, nearly two thirds of the world's population is going to be living in a water stress region. Water stress means you don't have good access to clean, fresh drinking water. So globally, the majority of water, the fresh water is used by agriculture, but in developed countries, that is a very, there's a very different story. As countries develop and become more industrialized, more than 50% of their fresh water resources is diverted to industrial use. And in fact, in countries like Denmark, it's more than 90% of their fresh water is consumed by industry. So what we have developed at Sierra Helix to address this problem is a technology that's widely used to clean water, which is known as filtration. Now filtration is, a filtration unit shown here is mostly filters surrounded by pumps and other, um, and tubes and control units. And each of these filter units is encompassed within this. So a single filter, you can have many, many of these filters. And the more filters you have, the more water you treat. So at Sierra Helix, what we've done is we've developed a coating that we apply to the inner surface of the filter. And what's unique about our technology is we've actually used DNA. We've mixed it in with the coating material, which is a ceramic. We then remove the DNA, leaving behind very small pores that are actually less than a nanometer in diameter. And in fact, these pores are what um, does the separation. So when water flows through these pores, they're so small, they can actually remove dissolved components in water. So with our filter, we can filter sugar, salts, even dissolved oil out of water. And what's, what people really like about our filter is that they're made out of ceramic. So here's some examples of the filters that we can actually coat with our technology. These are the type of filter geometries we're coating now in our lab up in Orono. <coughs> the more channels you have, the more surface area you can, so the more water you can treat per tube. So like I said before, you can have a small system, like shown here, to treat smaller volumes of water, up to very large systems to treat up to what they call 100,000 barrels of water a day. That's the largest system that we're currently conceptually working on. So one of our current customers is interested in using our technology to eventually treat that volume of water per day. Now in the US, most filters have always traditionally been made out of plastic or polymers. And they're very cheap, and they're used ubiquitously for treating drinking water. However, for industrial water, they have a problem in that they tend to foul due to like boiling water. They can also dissolve, so they don't withstand high temperature or solvents or low pH very, very well. So we use our filters for industries where they can't use the current type of filter technology. One of our customers is in um, the emerging biofuel industry where they're trying to convert agricultural waste to fuels and chemicals. Right now, if they're gonna try to do that conversion, they can't use filtration because the polymer filters don't work. So they have to use very energy intensive processes, things like evaporation or where they're boiling off the water to concentrate the sugar. So they use our filters to, to concentrate the sugar. We also work a lot with the oil and gas industry here in the US where they produce a lot of contaminated water when they extract water from deep in the earth using things like fracking or um, steam assisted gravity extraction in the oil sands of Canada. And there, they're interested in recycling a lot of that water. So right now, the oil companies that talk to us, either because of regulation or because they operate in a part of the world where water is scarce, they would like to take those 100,000 barrels of water a day that they're producing and actually repurpose that water to agriculture. 
And in fact, not just regulation, but also, as we all know, when they try and re-inject or dispose of that water, a lot of times what will happen is they, you know, we, we've all read in the paper that can create earthquakes or even um, contaminate the surrounding groundwater. So for instance, this is a project we're working on now where this is the process where from the left they, they separate all the oil and water out and they actually have to go through a complicated series of steps on site, which they were surprised. They, they went out to the water treatment industry and found they have all these steps to get to the water they needed. With our filter, they can do the same thing with a savings of 94% of the energy. So this is a picture of some of my team and some of the people who supported our research today. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. What I should have put in with Susan's bio is all the, the TED Talks and the different pitches that she says. Like, she's an old hand at this. Um, talking fast. Talking fast. Any questions that we can You're start off with? I'm, technology. Yep, you, yeah. Um, you're actually creating a size barrier for the molecules you don't want. Yes, it works in two ways. The, 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 the holes or the pores in the filter are so small, it both works by size exclusion, and there also can be some, it's called molecular separations. So the, there can be a charge on the surface of the, of the filter that actually repels some of the molecules. So there's two different ways it can interact. So the molecules you don't want don't foul that filter, they go on somewhere else. Yes, yeah, so the way our filter works in, in process is a, a process called cross flow filtration. So the majority of the water goes straight down the tube, and then we coat that inner surface and we apply pressure. So we don't get much, we don't, and our pores are so small, we don't get irreversible fouling. So we don't get, things don't clog up the pores. We get surface fouling on the surface, and then we do a clean, like a clean in place step to clean it off. What kind of DNA? We can use any DNA. Seriously? Yeah. We, um, the reason people, that's usually the first question I get asked. Actually, why DNA? <laughs> um, DNA is actually very unique. It has, it, it's got a business case and actually a chemistry case why we use it. It's um, the size and shape and the chemistry of DNA allow us to make a, a, an exact length that's identical. With, so we take a certain length of the DNA. And then the chemistry is such that it interacts more with the ceramic material. So we've actually, all our IP is, is, and all our trade secrets are how we get the DNA to dissolve in the ceramic so that it interacts and spreads out and disperses before we apply the coating. And so that way we have individual strands of DNA that are dispersed. And then because it interacts with the ceramic, the, the pores are small. You can use other types of molecules, but the pores are actually larger. They're almost always like two nanometers. But with the DNA, we get what they call six angstroms, so less than a nanometer size core. And then it's a business case because it's readily available. Right. Go ahead. Um, how much does this cost compared to conventional? Um, compared to other ceramics, it's, it's nearly identical. Because the DNA costs, it, let's say we sold the tube for $100, the DNA cost is less than a penny. So we're not adding a lot of cost by using DNA. So ceramics are more expensive than plastic filters, but they last longer and can obviously, they work where the polymers don't. Is the waste that you filter usable for anything? I mean, we don't always filter waste, so um, sometimes you do, sometimes it's not. Sometimes we, our filters are used to separate. So they separate a value-added product from a product you don't want. So it all depends on how the filter's used. But in the oily water case, no, you wouldn't reuse that waste. But what you've done is you've concentrated it down so now you can dispose of it more effectively. You're not, instead of disposing of large volumes of contaminated water, you've pre-concentrated the more hazardous material to a smaller package. Tim? Do you use this for drinking water? Or um, this not so much it's, that? it's beyond the purity needed for drinking water. With drinking water, you want to get rid of viruses and bacteria. We could be used for what I call first world drinking water problems. <laughs> you want to get rid of like pharma, pharmaceutical residue, drug residue from water, things that might over time cause cancer. But for basic drinking water, you really just want to get rid of you know, bacteria and viruses, which yeah. are much larger. Well, can I try to put it in context? Would this be like reverse osmosis, or would it be? We could be used in conjunction with RO, but we're not quite high enough purity to remove all the salt from water. So we, and we'd be a much more expensive option in that application than what you're doing with the polymer filters. So. How long does it take that's a very good question. <laughs> that's called um, permeance. So that's how fast our filter can, can work. We, um, it, 
the more pressure you apply, the faster you can filter. And so there's an energy and time, there's a cost trade-off for how fast you want to filter. And, and does the energy cost more? To you know, At some point, it's going to not be a payback. But in general, um, we haven't actually, we're, we're less expensive than an RO filter by like 30% in terms of treating water. It's usually how we explain it to the engineers. So RO is reverse osmosis, which is yes. this really funky thing that you can ask Susan about after. It's really cool. <laughs> Go ahead. You have to have like five million people spitting. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've talked about as a fundraiser, we could get wealthy people to donate their DNA, like have an auction. I know, it'd be really cool. Um, no, we actually buy the DNA. It's a byproduct of the biotech industry. They use what we call the cheap DNA or natural DNA. Like, for instance, in Maine, we can get it from a company that extracts it from the fish blood from the, as a byproduct of the aquaculture industry. Um, we've also used what we call synthetic DNA, where you can actually you know, make your own DNA, like oh, DNA oligos. And we've done it both ways to try and determine ourselves which one's more possible. That was fantastic.